Hello, I'm Helen Van Wyck and welcome to my studio. Today's lesson is about placement, the seed of good composition. Painting is not that easy, but any difficult job can be accomplished if you dissect it into stages, simple steps. It's like walking a trip of a thousand miles, it's a step at a time. Always respecting the outer edges so that the subject doesn't spill out or get too small, get it the way you want it, we make marks. And so that's going to be the top of the bottle and this is going to be the side of the blue milk bottle. Down here all the fruit uh, vegetables are going to land somewhere around in here. The last little slice of cucumber is going to be on the on the upper, the rightmost side, and then the little white pitcher. Surely, with these secure lines, looking at the entirety, uh, uh, you can say, what, how much do each of these uh, items take up? Well, maybe a suggestion for the blue milk can and then the suggestion for the bottle and then a suggestion for the lettuce, the cucumber and the other. You see these marks don't really exhaust you. You don't fall in love with what you've done and you're apt to juggle them more. Oh here it's where all these uh, the lemons all cut up are going to be. And they talk to you. They tell you whether you've composed the picture nicely, that it looks as though nothing is making the canvas tip too much to one side or too much to the other because in composition we do like to see the canvas well balanced. Also it tells you that you have variety. This size is not the same as this size, is not the same as this size. Many different sizes uh, spreads variety on the subject. And so we have balance and variety, two of the elements of good composition. Then within this you can see a little bit more about the structure. Not the exact drawing, but just the structure. These are all cylinders, or three cylinders, and the bottle. Also, this is a time that you can decide whether you want to alter the proportions. I don't like the size of that uh, lettuce. It's a little bit too big. So it's my poetic license to make it the size I want it. So don't just paint what you see. Paint what you want. And setting down a placement on the, on, on the the, the canvas can lead you to more artistic wants. Because after all, that's what you want to add into your picture. Not just to do it, but to do it artistically. Something that uh, looks natural, naturally lovely. Because it is nature that is rather lovely. Nothing wrong with nature. Can't fool with Mother Nature. We just want to make our artistic comment on it. And one of the things about nature is that nature is in balance and nature has a magnificent variety and unity about it. And so you can see that by starting with some simple marks, uh, you can make some judgments about each of the elements. If you start, let's say, what if I started this by just doing the bottle and making it big? Again, I would then maybe spill out of the canvas when I really didn't want to. So here it is, a simple beginning used on how to, how to do a still life. Oh, but now I want to show you how to place a landscape and this system doesn't work. You have to alter this system because outdoors you're just so overwhelmed with everything. So let me take this canvas down and get a canvas so that I can show you how I go about seeding a composition in landscape. Now we're faced with the problem of composition in the great outdoors. 
And when you go outdoors, you look at a spot and you see something fascinating, and that is your focal point. And so, it, painting outdoors, you start with your focal point and extend out, just the opposite of the way you do a still life or por do a portrait. How can you envelope the whole world? And so, right here, I think you'll notice, is what you look at first. And we never put the focal point in the middle. Uh, and it's always a little offside. It's down here toward the left-hand corner. Right there is my focal point. I always kind of say it starts and then it has to ooze out. And so from here I begin and then act accordingly so that the rest of the subject, the rest of the canvas supports the drama of the focal point. Now, with black and white and some umber, the tree. And how much it takes up. Sometimes, because outdoors you have the sun moving constantly, you have to be as quick as possible expedite it as easily as possible. Washing the dark pattern in with a cloth is easier than trying to wash it in with a, with, with a, with a brush. Sometimes when you have a brush in your hand, it can do so many wonderful things, you start to see the details rather than the general overall appearance that you should start with because you really should always have a, the simplest of beginnings. Now that I know where the tree is going to be, I'm going to say, yes, that's the trunk, and then I have another branch that goes off to the left. It's sinking in. This is one of the things I liked about it. I saw it, and it led over to the right, and so I left more space over to the right. It was almost automatic that I felt that the focal point should be to on this side. Because I did enjoy the fact that as I saw the tree, I did see the fence in relation to it. And the rocks. Edit what you see. Simplify it and get good, strong patterns. And since we're trying for the depth dimension, way in the back and then come forward, it almost seems practical to start with that which is furthest away, and that would be the sky. Thalo blue and white. Yes, I can tell you what colors I dip into, but I can't tell you the proportion exactly meaning how much white and how much blue. This is something you have to decide by actually putting the color down. I always say the best way to get the right color is to put the wrong one down first. See how wrong it is. Then you can always fix it. Because you're always addressing your picture to how it looks to you. Instead of a new mixture, I'm going to get the tree mixture right out of the sky mixture. That will help me get maybe a feeling of atmosphere. Because in painting outdoors, that's one of the things you have to take into consideration. The fact that this, these green trees are the same tone or the same kind of greenery as the tree in the foreground, but they're much lighter because there's more air between me and these trees. And painting um, distant trees, try to, again, employ a little bit of what I spoke about when I was showing you the placement and composition of, the, of, of still life. Try to make that shape have variety. Not all exactly the same, as though you're, it looks like you're a whole bunch of lollipops all in a row. You may think that it's just the fact that I'm rushing a little bit so that you can see how I do this, that it, 
that I overlap, but I overlap all the time, so that these colors can meet. And then there's a road, yellow ochre and white, in this particular situation. Many of these elements that you see in a landscape have to be translated into brushwork. Things that are up and down are painted up and down. Things that lay flat sometimes are recorded better in a ver horizontal strokes. And now the fence, where it sticks up, can be horizontal strokes, I mean vertical strokes. I try, when I paint outdoors, to limit my painting session to two hours. Because in two hours, the sun remains somewhat the same. All the, the contrasts are kind of similar. Because here, on this day, the sun was hitting the tops of this stone wall. And the sun was hitting the tops of these stones here. As the day goes on, the whole composition changes because composition is so much a matter of beautiful patterns of light and dark. And of course, back now that it's the, situa the canvas is all ready for it, I can put the tree back. And this is a cast shadow from the tree in the foreground. So, putting in the overall composition, starting from the focal point, and seeing how you can relate the rest of it to it, is the way I begin a landscape, and I don't do it quite as roughly as this, but I do do it rather broadly so that I can go back and then work into all these areas. For instance, I would go back and work into the sky now that I know where the sky is. Again, starting at the focal point, starting at the tree, making sure that my sky is most active and excitingly colored in the interior of the picture. I would never just make a big light thing over here. It might distract. So everything emanates from the focal area. It's a good idea when you're painting to constantly step back and see how things are going. You can see that I did spend quite a bit of time developing this focal area. I put sky holes in and made sure that the light was flashing behind this tree and making sure that I had a nice silhouette of this dark tree against the lighter tree and then this grass that comes up in front of it. And so I spend my time developing the focal point. I've taken the painting that I was working from and put it on my easel and even though it was more advanced than the one I was showing you because it after all they only diagrammed what this important factor of painting which is the placement and the beginning and I can see that I would even on this uh, try to focus the eye more on the, f the, the focal point by livening up the sky right around here, maybe being a little bit more accurate about these little sky holes, making sure that the interest stays right in through here. Uh, this, maybe this uh, could be brightened. Oh yes, that helps a lot. 
And so I hope that you've gained some insight and maybe less fear about beginning a picture. And next time when we meet, I'm going to tell you all about how dimensionality breeds reality, or maybe I'll just teach you how to make soup.